um, restructure or list the Agriculture Development Bank. And they have done it nicely, one company in Singapore. And he asked me to go and study if I get there and come back and report to him. And I did that and gave him a good report that this is how the people did there. So he has been a very good friend of mine. Uh, I have a very memorable picture with him that uh, when you come and you see it, you see that we're in a tata tea uh, manner. So I'm happy uh, I've come back after a long uh, uh, while of uh, having these things with him to chair uh, this meeting, which is this ceremony, which is in his honor, uh, that is lecture. Um, the theme of the lecture too is something that we are working on uh, this time, especially the word haircut. I will say something is more about a haircut. Traditionally, a haircut is when you have lost part of your principal. But, but now Ghana, we, have, we, we are using haircuts, and I call the, our, our usage of haircut in Ghana as technical haircut. It's like knockout. When the, the, the fighter, your opponent knocks you down, that is knockout. But if you are fighting and you can't, and the referee stop it, it is technical knockout. So our haircut now, and sometimes when people say, the president said it was going to be any haircut. Yes, I agree. No traditional haircut. Because once your principal is not slash, there is no haircut. But people have said every loss of money is haircut. And so once we are losing something, we call it haircut. So that is technical haircut. So we have all now taking the haircut to be anything that is lost, whether it is interest, whether it's the duration of time that you have to wait, it is haircut. So I think we are using this haircut in that uh, knockout haircut uh, 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 terms. So everything that we have gone through, if it's technical one, then there has been a technical knockout because you have lost some uh, coupon. The rates on your uh, bond has com come down. You have, been, you have extended your... Uh, maturity period and then of course we have also have to wait even for the coupons that were supposed to be given to us on time plus the principal so that amounts to our technical knockout that everything that is lost in ghana here and the the, the modern uh, term of knockout has become once there is anything that is causing you to lose value and value even if your money was supposed to come to you yesterday and it comes to you next week, there is a loss in value. So in Ghanaian times, it will be one of the knock <laughs> haircuts. And so I call that technical haircut. And I think we are privileged to have Dr. Chiu Champon to lead us through this. And then at the end of the day, I believe there, there will be opportunity for people to comment. Even Do we, do we have people commenting online? If, if not, then the people here will have to raise any question that you have to raise, you, you raise and it will be, uh, it will be addressed. So I'll, 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 I'll end here, uh, since I'm not the, the, the speaker, and just say you are all welcome and help me to manage the affairs of this function to a successful end. Thank you. And we're very grateful to our chairman for the event, Dr. Edu Anani Enki. Time now for us to get into the main event, and we're going to be hearing from our main speaker for the day. As has already been mentioned, whatever your description of haircut, we are definitely talking about that financial haircut that we are receiving, and which is still ongoing per what we have heard from uh, government in recent days and maybe weeks. The theme beyond the haircut, the prospects for investments and public finances in Ghana in the next decade. To elaborate on this matter, once more, economist, political risk activist, he's in the person of our speaker, Dr. Theo Echampo. Please, let's welcome him.
Uh, okay, good afternoon, uh, everyone. I hope we're all doing uh, great and well. Uh, it's always good to be physically present um, in, in Ghana um, to deliberate on um, important um, national um, matters. I want to recognize the chair. I also want to recognize um, the, um, the executive director of uh, Ghana Institute of Public Policy Options, uh, Uncle Charles, as I call him, or sometimes I say Wafa. Um, he's been in this space, um, like many others, for uh, a while um, in terms of uh, doing uh, advocacy. Um, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, all protocols uh, observed. Um, thank you this afternoon for um, inviting me to be the speaker and to share some thoughts uh, on the prospect for public finances and investments in Ghana um, in the next 10 uh, years. As the MC had already indicated, um, the Kujuba Radio Memorial Lecture was established um, back nine years ago in 2014, and it seeks to recognize and immortalize the life and the works of the great man, uh, Kwejuba um, Redu. And the speaker, the MC, did indicate two um, key tenets or principles that drove his public life. First one being that the public finances of Ghana must be managed and accounted for as prescribed by the Constitution of the Republic of Ghana. You could even add subsequent other laws that have been passed, like the Public Financial Management Act um, and related um, matters. And then number two, the public service is an honor and a recognition which has to be reciprocated through excellence in performance and humility at all times. And uh, Akapu raised the question, is that what we see in recent times? I, I would leave the judgment for all of us to reflect on. But it is especially on the first point that I want to elaborate and talk a little bit about um, the country's public finances and um, the overall sort of economic prospects um, and to see how things have played out. Um, yes, we're still in the process of the haircut business. So it's, it's, we're, we're told in the news wires and what we're reading that it's not fully over yet. But I think we also need to look beyond that to ask ourselves. So once all of these um, dead restructurings uh, or for a lame man call it haircut is completed, what does that do or what would that do for the economy of Ghana and importantly, how does this translate into improving the livelihoods of Ghanaians? I think from where I'm coming from, for far too long, we've become a bit fixated with you know, talking broad macroeconomic numbers. So we'll talk policy rate, we'll talk inflation, we'll talk uh, borrowing, debt, etc. But at the end of the day, we've got to break it down and connect it to how it impacts people's livelihoods on the ground, um, especially in the context of the IMF program that we have signed on to. So that's really what I want to use the next couple of minutes really to highlight and, and deliberate uh, a number of points on. So the first uh, objective that I seek to attain in terms of this uh, lecture really is that we, we want to look at the country's um, economic landscape. Um, and then secondly, we'll look at Ghana's public finances and we'll look at to what extent, if any, do um, external factors, so you would have heard in the commentary again a lot of talk being made uh, about Russia, Ukraine, and COVID being responsible for uh, the mess that we find ourselves in. Uh, I will show you that, yes, partly true, 
but that is not fully the case and the data actually bears this uh, out and then i think really going forward the question then becomes you know so what does this mean for investments and um, what does this mean for uh, the uh, economy um, going forward um, um, I am uh, an economist and a finance person, so please do oblige me. I've got lots of charts and lots of data points that I'll be using to tell the story, because I think it's, it's important um, to, to, to do that. So in terms of outline for this, this uh, lecture and conversation, like I've already indicated, we will look at the economic landscape I will go specific into the IMF program that we've signed and what it means for uh, the country's public finances. Then also look at the investment prospects and finish off with some policy options or measures that, in my view, uh, are required to prevent uh, a recurrence of Ghana's um, experience. And here, just to signal, I think one of the big elephants in the room here really is the politics. That the, what we are seeing with the economy and all of the restructuring and all of the inflation issues is a manifestation of a much bigger problem that we have in this country, which is how public finances are run and ultimately how incentives are created within the politics. And not until we fundamentally address that whether it be through constitutional reforms, et cetera, in my view, would just be tackling the surface of the problem, and this would end up coming back to bite us uh, again. So that's really what I, I, I seek to, to do um, in this conversation. So let me start first and foremost uh, with uh, a discussion or a conversation on the um, recent uh, economic experience. And I think there are two key events that comes into um, question um, in terms of how uh, the economy has performed in the last um, two to three years. The first thing being COVID, the pandemic. Uh, we saw the lockdowns, and the lockdowns then meant that, as you see on the chart on your left-hand side, um, almost every country in the world um, is showing red, which is, you know, recording uh, in some instances negative growth or growth that is even less than 3% uh, percentage points of, uh, of real GDP. Then the vaccines started becoming available um, and increasingly we started um, uh, reducing some of those um, stay-at-home measures and as we speak currently, most economies have, in a way, recovered, as you see uh, on your uh, right-hand uh, side chat there. The question then is, if COVID affected everyone, and most government had to made, make certain um, interventions to support the well-being of the people, how come that in Ghana's case, it particularly is much more Precarious, and I'll show uh, a couple of um, chats to, to, to talk about that. Then, of course, um, in all of that, there's also the Russia-Ukraine war. So immediately after the economies, global economy started reopening in the uh, latter part of 2021, coming into 2022, we saw uh, Putin um, invade Russia um, in February, I believe 24th of February of 2022, and then that also has had a major um, impact on global economy. But in all of this, governments have provided a range of interventions to support the economies uh, through what we call, you know, tax side policies or fiscal policies, and then also on the monetary. Uh, um, and the macro financial side, for example, reducing the policy rate and subsequently with Russia, Ukraine, the policy rate also beginning um, to, to go back up. I think these are two important contextual factors. But of course, the big question is, does it all explain the challenges that Ghana and its economy 
has gone through in the last two years. And um, like I've highlighted earlier, it does not explain everything. And one of the big things here you would see is election year spending, um, which you know really is is the big elephant um, in in the in the room. So for many for many countries, in the context of Russia, Ukraine, and in the context of COVID, um, you can see it on your on the on the again the chart there that a number of the countries that approached um, uh, the IMF for some form of bailout or other were in Sub-Saharan Africa, right? Um, and in the Sub-Saharan African context, some um, work and estimates even indicate that we've lost almost 10 years of progress on the development front as a result of both the pandemic and um, the uh, Russia-Ukraine um, conflict um, in, in that regard. So with Russia-Ukraine, we saw the big spike in um, commodities prices, especially food um, and fuel. And as you see uh, on, the, uh, the, on your screen, you see in the period or the pace that we started recovering after the pandemic, you can see for a number of commodities, whether it is oils or is grains or is metals or beverages, you see a bit of a sharp um, upward spike in the data from uh, about the middle part of 2020, right? Um, and then this is sustained all the way until about 2021. But then just observe right after the... Uh, Russian um, invasion of Ukraine um, and subsequent matters, you see another big sharp spike in the, the data in terms of these commodity prices. And this is important uh, because if you look at a number of the countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, including Ghana, the two biggest items in the consumer basket is actually food and fuel or call it transportation. So you see then subsequently this beginning to um, filter through into um, inflation and inflation beginning to, uh, to go up. But what is also really interesting is that even before the inflation starts going up and starts um, impacting the economy of Ghana and many other um, countries, if you look at Ghana specifically, so now I'm narrowing it down to Ghana issues, and we decided to plot the history of the country's economic growth over 20, 25 years, there are two really interesting stories that you begin to see. So the big thing that happens is in 2010, 2011, we start producing and exporting crude oil. And if you work out the compounded annual growth rate, year on year change, over the 10 years from 2001 until 2011, where we had our biggest growth rate of about 14%, on average, the economy was growing at about 7% right, a year. And then oil comes in, we take our eyes off the ball, and we start, of course, um, borrowing again. So remember that even before oil, in the early 2000s, um, under um, the President Kufo regime, we had the big HIPIC relief and initiatives and the multilateral debt relief, and that brought our debt levels also down. But immediately that we started closing those um, initiatives and oil also comes in, we start actually debt binging all over again. And then two events happened as well. So you have the Doomsaw crisis, uh, which is from 2014 to 2016, 17. And around that time, we entered into our 16th IMF program. And then we have the pandemic. And of course, we've entered our 17th program. The second story there is that if you take the 10 years after oil, and you work out the same growth rate, on a compounded annual growth rate terms, 
we've been growing at negative 11 percent every year since oil came into the equation and the data is there and if you even decided to for argument's sake put in a trend line all the way through which is the dots that you see on your screen you see that it's actually coming down and not going up so something fundamentally is amiss with the way we have been running our economy and as we see later on in this uh, um, uh, lecture this growth is not even necessarily translating into improving livelihoods at the bottom and that's another thing that we have to um, take uh, into uh, account okay so if you now extend that and we now focus specifically on the period from 2010 to 2022 the problem is that we have been spending we have been spending beyond what we collect in terms of revenue right so persistently for the last 10 years we've had about 5% gap between our revenue and our expenditure so what that means is that if you are collecting for example 100 Ghana cities in um, revenue you are spending 105 CDs right in expenditure and that 5 CD extra you either have to borrow money from somewhere to finance your uh, your budget or the deficit or you have to cut back on uh, expenditure but in our case expenditure cuts have not even been a part of the policy conversation it's often really uh, in my view um, mere talk because you see budget statement after budget statement and in those budget statement there are often line items there about cutting expenditure but in fact when the uh, appropriations are done and the fiscal outends are released and you go and look at the numbers versus what was said in the budget they are two completely different stories right um, so you can see clearly in this chart here that the orange line is at the top and the blue line is at the bottom right and it becomes a bit more pronounced especially during COVID um, and the subsequent years so you see that gap there is actually quite um, quite big um, of course we had to spend to sustain the economy during the pandemic but at what cost and at what expense and then there's also another thing if you again take the same thing and we decide to go back so let's do a bit more detailed analysis over 20 years right you can see what I was also saying earlier that if you look at the difference between your revenue and your expenditure which is the green bar at the bottom of your left hand side chart right you see those green bars beginning to increase in size almost every year after uh, 2011 there about and then uh, on the revenue side uh, a similar thing you know uh, happening uh, uh, as well and then I, I do a, another comparison which I would come to in a moment in the next chart that shows that if you plot this and you did this same analysis on a year-to-year -year basis the changes in expenditure are much more pronounced especially around election years and I'll come to that in a, in a moment so sometimes you see we enter into an IMF program we exit there's an election year and there's a lot of spending and then we end up you know basically back at uh, square one all over uh, again the other thing really also is is this that if you look at the um, expenditure item right so I've talked about revenue and expenditure but let's maybe just narrow a little bit down to just expenditure you would often hear a lot of talk about structural rigidities in the budget now what does this really mean in simple terms you have almost three line items on your expenditure side practically consuming all of the revenues that we are collecting so I've got an example here and this is from the Ministry of Finance the 2023 budget 
And if you look at the right hand side um, chart, which has three items there. So uh, compensation, interest payments, and grants to other government units. If you add those three items up, that is taking almost 90% of your domestic revenues that you're collecting. So there's really not much to spend on other sort of priority areas. The question then, of course, which we'll again come to is, if we narrow down just on the interest payments and, and the borrowings and all of that, what have these monies been utilized for? Have they been productive? Have they sustained the economy? And I'll show you a chart soon that actually shows um, what we, we call a negative correlation between our GDP growth and our public spending, right? So we are borrowing and spending but in terms of correlation, and we, this is not even causality, but you actually see the two are going completely different directions. So again, there's something wrong. And what is wrong, I would argue, comes down to our politics and how we run public finances more broadly. So let me talk or um, highlight the bit about the government deficit spending and the election year effect that I was talking uh, about a few moments ago. So here what you see is um, 12 years worth of data. And what I've done is to take the difference between your revenue and your expenditure. So basically you are comparing the year on year, every year the change between your revenue and your expenditure, right? Um, and the red line there is just the expenditure growth, so year on year. And you can observe three pronounced peaks in there, right? So between 2011 and 2012, the expenditure grows by almost about, what, 5%, right, year on year. If you come to between 2015, and then it goes down, yeah? We start entering into an IMF. Uh, no, that time we're already, we're already just coming out of this um, the 15th IMF program when uh, Atameos came into, into power. Um, but you can see after the 2012 election, the expenditure year on year starts coming down. So there's some form of cuts or some austerity that is taking place. Now observe, between 2015 and 2016, what happens? You see the same pattern now being repeated again, right? So if you actually work the cumulative change, that uh, expenditure over around there is almost about 8% from 2015 to, um, to 2016. Then we start making an adjustment again. So the new government comes into power. There's some adjustments that are taking place. And then what happens again? Between 2019 going into 2020, the pandemic, you also see right a similar thing being repeated there again. And this time around, the change there is almost about 10 or 11 um, percentage point uh, change in there. So you can actually see, and, and in all of this, the change in the expenditure growth is way bigger than the change in the revenue growth, right? Which is the blue bars that you see there. So clearly, when our revenues are even underperforming, right? In some instances, like in 2016, you see a drop in revenue, it comes down, but you see a big spike in expenditure, right? Similar thing in 2020, right, uh, as well. Um, and you see this pattern consistently being repeated if you decide to extend this data point going all the way back to even 1993 when we started the Fourth Republic. So something really is, is wrong in my view here and, and the data is quite clear on, on this. So before we even talk about IMF program and what to do and public finances, the, the one of the root cause issues here is the politics and the spending, you know, which is driven by the, um, the electoral cycle and then the commodity price cycle. There's a bit of 
the commodity price uh, um, um, effect there. But by and large, a lot of the perverse outcomes that we're seeing um, on our public finances is driven by the electoral cycle or some what we call the political uh, uh, economy. So you see that during the pandemic, um, a lot of money was put into supporting people. The government actually pumped out uh, about $2 billion or roughly 22 billion Ghana cities to support the economy during the pandemic. Uh, this came from multiple sources, including the, the World Bank um, and the IMF. But what this did was that if you were to go back and read the 2020 budget, which was read in November of 2019, the government then said that they were going to run an overall deficit of about 5%. Um, and it actually ended up being around um, um, about 14% in um, 2020 and another 12% in 2021. So a lot of money was borrowed and pumped into the economy under the ambit of trying to sustain um, you know, uh, uh, livelihoods during the pandemic. But the, the amounts in question and what went in versus what the deficit was actually meant to have been, in my view, could have been contained. And I think that there was some excess spending driven in part by the fact that in December of 2020, we had a major election on our hands in there, right? So some would argue that government used COVID as, a, as some sort of a cloak to overspend during the election. Um, and you can see uh, a bit of that in, in the data. So then, if you begin to look at this, and you begin to look at other reports, the IMF and others, that had been warning us as far back as 2018, 2019, you don't need to be a prophet to sit back and say that we were heading into a ditch. And it was going to come at the expense of uh, livelihoods um, and things that we needed to do. And part of it is, of course, like I've highlighted or talked about, is this whole um, borrowing. Um, and I've got a, a table here that just shows uh, in the case of, for example, Eurobonds. So you recall, um, uh, I think it was the president that made a statement that the market turned against Ghana and suddenly we could no longer borrow. And that's why we are in, in the problem that we find ourselves in. But if you look at the data um, uh, and plot it out, um, we first went to the market in 2007, and that was under President Kufuor, 750 million. Um, under President Mahama, there were four um, euro bonds that they took totaling, I think it's 3.75 billion. Then just look at the data there from 2018 to 2021. You can tally that, but that's really close to almost nine or so billion from these, you know, uh, borrowings from the external market. Um, and there was even one that I think when it came in, uh, they said we were celebrating the triple hat trick. Ghana was exiting the IMF um, and we had gotten uh, our Euro bond. Uh, that was the 20, I think 2020 or 2019. Um, uh, and then the budget was also being read around that time to the point that we even had a a kinky, the famous kinky party at the, at the Ministry of Finance, right? But, but this is the problem. So for me, without fundamentally understanding the root causes and what drives this, I think that we do or will do this country and the future generation a great disservice because we are only tackling the wound. We're not tackling the, the thing what has festered deep into the very you know, fabric of the, of the country. And some of the reform proposals that I make are around how to you know, pretty much curtail the hands of uh, our public officials with uh, some of these. Because whether we like it or not, some of them would come and they'll go. But these decisions have 
major impact on people's welfare and livelihoods. We are talking about haircuts and even a second round of it where, you know, whether it is principal or it's, or it's interest, it's still money that you're losing. Because in finance, there's something they call the, the time value of money. And I'm sure the chair will bear me out, you know, uh, on, on, on that. So I want to contrast Ghana with Chile uh, as an example of how to run your public finances, right? So just observe uh, Chile, which is on your left-hand side um, chart there. And again, it's the same analysis we've been doing so far. So we're only looking at the change in expenditure versus the change in revenue on a year-by-year -year basis. And there's something really remarkable in the case of uh, Chile, which also is a commodity exporting nation. They do a lot of copper and other things. But if you look at the blue line on the left-hand side chart, you can almost see that it doesn't really change that much, right? So even in years like during the financial crisis of 2008, 2009, where they had a major dip in revenue, they have been able to maintain a consistent expenditure profile or pattern, that line. But if you compare that to, to Ghana on your right-hand side, right, when our revenues go down, sometimes we spend more. Sometimes when our revenues comes up, then we also cut back. It's like all over the place. And, and that's not how to run public finances. We attempted to cure this in 2018 with the Fiscal Responsibility Act, and also even set up a, a fiscal council as well. Um, but then the pandemic came and the act was suspended without any um, timeline to it. In fact, the, I recall the um, indication by the government was that it was going to be until 2024, 2025, before we can even think of, of um, you know, uh, bringing back the Fiscal Responsibility Act. If we don't have some of these laws to keep our um, uh, decision makers in check, what I worry and I fear is that we're going to see the same haphazard pattern of revenues going up, expenditure sometimes going or coming down, and we are not able to, one, sustain the growth but ultimately leads to a situation where the country is almost broke and you now have to go to the IMF and do um, further restructuring of your, uh, of, of your debt, whether it is external or um, it is um, domestic debt. Part of the problem, before we talk solutions, is also if you look at the expenditure itself, and you go down into looking at how and where the monies are spent, we have a major problem there, right? So it's not just a question of the, the quantums or the volumes, but actual amounts, sectors, and where these monies uh, are spent. So this is a fishbone from a piece of work that I was involved with back in 2019, um, and we decided to look at um, spending inefficiencies in the social sector, so health, education, social protection. And if you were to diagnose all the problems, you actually would come to these issues there, one of which is that when it comes to issues of like procurement, for example, there is a lot of poor planning within there. And the reason is that some of the contracts are influenced by political processes, right? Or even if they are not, some of the MDAs, the ministries, departments, and agencies would commit and incur these expenditures even beyond the limits that have been given to them by the budget, right? Um, and then there are other things around gifts, around um, the poor management of cash, and even, you know, um, budget formulation and strategic planning. So I just want to highlight the point here that it's not just a question of the quantums of expenditure, but we also have a problem in how we spend those monies. And there's often 
in terms of value for money, very little that you see coming across in a lot of government, you know, projects. Uh, and if we had been doing all the, these things, we wouldn't have had the cost to go to the uh, to the IMF, and then subsequently even try to restructure domestic debt, which you know uh, um, impacted uh, a lot of a lot of people uh, as well. Okay. So let me talk about the last bit here on this on problem diagnosis, and we 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 talk um, some of the the solutions. So I want to talk a bit on the macro or monetary side of things with Bank of Ghana and inflation targeting and um, monetary policy. Um, so again, I have a, a chart here. I think I've got charts on almost every slide that I, I produce because they help me to tell the story um, without talking much. So here is data again that I've compiled going all the way back to January of 2010. So there are three data points there. There's um, inflation, there's the policy rate, and then the 182 Treasury bill rate, right, uh, equivalent. And what is really interesting is that from 2010 until about um, 2021, broadly speaking, if you were investing in some of these government securities or treasuries, um, you were earning um, a, a positive real return. So what we mean by that is that the inflation was lower than the treasury bill rate. And you can see that on the, on the chart here. But it also did indicate that in some sense, the inflation targeting regime that the Bank of Ghana was um, uh, pursuing was working somewhat. So you see this tight band or those three data points, you know, um, moving um, together. Then something happens from January of 20, or February 2022, there about Russia, Ukraine. So you see inflation now starts to overshoot the policy rate. So that's the, the one, the top line at the, at the top there. And what this then means is that if you are investing into government securities, buying bonds and all of those things, in real terms, you're actually getting a negative right, uh, return. Um, but to the point that also secondly that the inflation targeting regime now starts becoming largely ineffective because inflation was jumping much, much, much faster and the hikes that the Policy, monetary policy committee of the Bank of Ghana was putting it was not enough to control the supply of money. Largely also, and, and this is the bit that people also sometimes um, forget, but I think it's been discussed in the literature. But largely also, Bank of Ghana was a corporate in all of this exercise, right? So let me show you here again. Um, these numbers are of official numbers uh, from either Ministry of Finance or uh, Bank of Ghana. So this is the um, budget numbers that were presented the year um, before. So let me quickly just explain this. So in the 2022 budget, if you look at the second column on the table on your left hand side there, the government anticipated, so this is the budget that was read in November of 2021 that it was going to spend 100 billion and uh, it was going to, um, sorry, it was going to raise 100 billion in revenue and spend 135 billion in expenditure. And that gives you a difference of 35, okay? Of that 35 billion, if you look at where the money was going to come from to, to finance the, uh, the, the deficit, right, largely, Bank of Ghana didn't even feature at all in that conversation. I think it's on the second chart here. The Bank of Ghana doesn't feature at all in that conversation. So the 35, 37 billion, if you, look, if you break it down, um, on the domestic side, the government anticipated that it was going to raise 28 billion, right, from the domestic market. But if you look further down, most of this was going to come from 
treasury bills and other instruments. So the commercial banks and then the non-banking sector. And then in the media budget, when they came to parliament in July of 2022, so this is the third column that you see on there. The numbers don't change much, except to say that this time around, out of the 28 billion total domestic financing, Bank of Ghana was going to provide just about 8 billion of that. Now something happens between July and the end of the year where you now see the total financing now increases from 39 billion to 65 billion. And within that 65 billion, 55 billion, so this is the last column there, is coming from the domestic sources. And of that 55 billion, just note the line, the item there. Bank of Ghana provides 53 billion of that 55 billion from the total domestic financing. So at a point where, of course, the markets had closed, the government couldn't borrow. And like I said, we have had even been borrowing in the past, and uh, you don't really see the catalytic effect of these borrowings on improving the economic fortune. So when everybody pulled back, then somebody has to step in to finance the, the gap. But the issue, I guess, many of us or people had raised really is that if you came in July and you said that you need a gap of uh, about uh, 39, so let's say 40 billion roughly, how come that number jumps to now 65 billion and to the point that your central bank is financing almost about what 70% or so of, of that uh, figure there? that the central bank itself, if you read its act and its mandate, it's very clear that they cannot lend to the government more than 5% of the previous years. This is in the law. They broke the, the central bank actually broke its own law. And the central bank, the act that sets it up, Act 612, even further says that if you want to go beyond this, go to parliament, um, and also engage the, um, uh, so the minister shall, um, let me just read section uh, 16.7, where the total advance of loans, purchase of treasury bills and securities made under one is 5% of the previous year's total revenue, the governor shall notify the minister and parliament of the attainment of the limit, right? And of course, the minister upon this shall put a report to parliament of the remedial measures that are meant to be taken. There's been a lot of debate about this. And um, from where I sit, I could be wrong, but it doesn't seem as though that was strictly followed to the latter. And that's again, a problem that we need to take into into account. So what I've done so far is to take you through the genesis of our economic history, but not focusing on just the current issues, but to show you that we've had a problem going all the way back to the maybe 12 years. You can even extend the data. And the problem largely lies in the politics, which is manifesting itself in the economics. So the economic challenges that we are having is a manifestation of a bigger problem, and the problem is the politics. So the question is, how do we fix the politics? So we've got the IMF program, um, and of course, we went to the IMF uh, in a crisis, and when you go, when you are sick and you go to the hospital in an ambulance in an emergency, they have to provide emergency measures, right? They have to stabilize you first, and then maybe move you from ICU into the world, and now start thinking about what to do next. And that's really what we uh, ended up with. But like the IMF itself says that there were pre-existing fiscal and debt vulnerabilities, largely driven by the political um, uh, cycle in, in itself. And then I talked about the fact that if you look at our tax and spend, and this is a very important um, 
uh, chat here because today uh, when when I came, I went to get a haircut and I was having a conversation with the barber uh, there about how they are how they are feeling broadly, and I think he made a very interesting remark. This is he's um, 34 years old. He finished school somewhere in the northern part of the country and is in Accra um, doing whatever. I've completed secondary school, but very sharp, very bright uh, person. And he made a remark uh, in um, the, the, the tree language to the point that we have been borrowing, 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 but we don't see the effect. In fact, he's indicated that for him, he doesn't even see what the government has done for him personally. And that, this was just about an hour and a half or so ago when I stepped out. And that, I think, struck with me. But also you can see part of that narrative in the chart that I have here on your left-hand side, right? So here, what I do is you look at the change in our public debt and you look at the change in our GDP. And what is quite stark here is that the two are going in opposite directions, Right? So we're borrowing. The debt is there, but the debt is not necessarily impacting our growth. So you ask yourself, so where is the money? Yeah. Some of it is paying interest. So some of the past debt that we had borrowed, and some of those past debt were also not really used for the productive ventures that it should have been useful, right? So even talking haircuts and all of this and second round, I think for us as citizens, we need to be perhaps even much more harder on the government because here you are asking us to forego certain interests and certain benefits. But like the um, barber that I, I met and interacted with just an hour, an hour and a half ago, he doesn't feel, he doesn't see he doesn't experience, you know, what the, you may call the social contract, right? So he's just there doing his own thing. But as far as they are concerned, government is something that is far removed, right, from, 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 from them. But of course, if the economy tanks and inflation tanks, like we're seeing, and with prices going up, they have to spend more money to buy their goods and to buy uh, services uh, in in, in that regard, okay. So we are dead distressed, we are restructuring our debt. Um, I want to quickly talk on the external debt. So it, now I'm now moving into solutions and what we can, we can do um, to improve the load. And this, I've classified them into about three sort of uh, buckets. So uh, options and measures around our tax and spend policies I'll talk on the external debt, and then I'll also talk about some of the expenditure um, reforms that are linked to the political economy that we need to uh, address. In a lot of the conversation that we have heard, um, a lot of reference is made between Ghana and Zambia, um, and the need to look at Zambia's recent debt deal as a potential template when it comes to restructuring uh, our external debt. In fact, even in G Zambia's case, they did not restructure their domestic debt. They just said, no, no. So they're only dealing with the uh, external uh, creditors. But what they agreed, the 6.3 billion of relief that they've agreed with uh, external creditors, is really interesting on two or three fronts. The first thing is that, like Ghana's case, their debt to GDP doesn't decline sharply overnight. However, they've been given some grace period, right, on their principal repayment, I think it's three years, and then also the interest rates have been brought down. And then there's also a conditional clause there that says that in the event that the Zambian economy starts outperforming, so it starts growing beyond like 4%, then they have to pay back more, right, uh, to, uh, to, this is one of the new um, things that um, is being uh, incorporated in that. And I think it's a good template 
that Ghana could use in terms of pushing for savings on the external debt. And what I mean by this is that if you actually work out the debt profile and you look at the numbers very carefully, if we are able to negotiate hard on the external front, there will be no need for a second round of domestic debt exchange. It's very clear. So on the financing side, if you look at the IMF's own numbers, between now and 2026, we need to raise uh, about 15 billion of uh, financing dollars, right? Out of that, from our official sources, the IMF World Bank, that's roughly 4.5 billion. And the major chunk, so 10.5 billion dollars is money that we should be getting from the external debt restructuring. Now the problem why, or what I, why I think the government is trying to push for a second round of the domestic debt exchange is that in this year alone, they need, need to have raised 2.5 billion, so that's the number I've highlighted there, 2.482 billion from debt relief from the external front, right? But we are already in um, end of September, going into October, November and there are no indications as yet that that will be coming through. So basically, if you have rigidities on this external debt restructuring front, then something must give. And what may give is the domestic side, where there's like a second round of debt exchange. In my view, it is not needed. I think um, if we cut back on some line items in the, on the expenditure side and we're much more um, emphatic on value for money and things and having a clear case for that, there is no need to impose further hardship on citizens of this country. Because however you slice and dice it, the debt exchange is hit people quite hard. You know, um, uh, Dr. Duinchi has been on the streets. We've been seeing him on TV the last few weeks and I'm like, hey, you should be retiring and, you know, enjoying and looking after the, the grandchildren. But that is not the case. And I don't think it necessarily is fair on other citizens as well in, in, that, in that regard. Um, but that's really what it is, that if there are delays with getting the big relief, this 10.5 or 2.4 billion every year from the external front, then there's the temptation to try and um, restructure the domestic debt further. And that is even going to impose more hardship on, um, on Ghanaians uh, in, in, that, in, that, uh, in that regard. Okay. So uh, on the reform side, of course, um, there are some proposals about um, amending the Bank of Ghana Act um, the point really here is that, in my view, the central bank has become weak and to an extent even captured by on the fiscal policy side. The IMF's own words, they call it fiscal dominance, but in very simple terms, what it means is that they don't have control necessarily over monetary policy because it is really the, the Ministry of Finance and the Treasury that is dictating more or less the response and the things that they need to do. So I think there are some proposals there for reform. And one of it really is okay. We need very clear guidelines on the conditions under which you can finance the, 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 the deficit beyond that 5%, um, how you lift those things, uh, how you lift those conditions and who you should consult um, in the in the process, this is a, an urgent one that has to be to be tackled as part of the the broader uh, uh, reforms. I've already indicated that, in my view, a second round of debt exchange is not um, is not um, uh, is not needed. Then there's also the talk about the financial stability fund that was talked about. Uh, I don't know how far the government has moved on on that, but there's meant to be some additional monies that is meant to provide liquidity and solvency. Perhaps maybe 
when uh, our lady guest also comes, she might maybe some make some uh, remark or two uh, on on that on that front. But but these these are the big elephant things that we need to address, in my view, going forward, right? Uh, uh, the tax reforms, the public financial management, the state-owned enterprises, many of them very very weak. It, it it's it's it, it, it's a bit sad when you take the there's a report published by the Ministry of Finance every year called the State um, Ownership Report, SOE report. Um, so they take all of the government um, entities, it's about 150 plus or so of them, and they report on their financials. And if you look at a number of these SOEs, joint ventures, and other um, entities that the government has some stake or partnership, many of them are hemorrhaging money. They are leaking money. And if we don't address those issues, then we have taken a branch in the form of haircuts and, and things you know, uh, like that. The big one that I want to quickly highlight and try and wrap the conversation up really is on, on governance, right? I have already indicated that we talk a lot about the economic issues but we don't put a lot of emphasis on the governance side which gives cause to the problems that we see. There's an interesting quote from the IMF recent report on Ghana. Um, so this is on paragraph 43 or page 22 of the document. And it says that performance in government, government effectiveness, regulatory quality, and control of corruption have deteriorated over the last 10 years. This is not me saying it. This is from the IMF's own mouth. And you can also see it with other indicators as well. So largely, if we don't address and fix these issues, we'll be here, we'll have another maybe forum in five years time when we've done our 18th, 19th, and 20th IMF programs and still talking about what you know uh, needs to be done. There are some proposals there, uh, one of which really is uh, some new law that they want to um, introduce. In fact, it's actually not new. The bill has been around for quite a while. It's called the uh, New Conduct of Public Officers Act. And to do with asset declaration and things like that, we are all aware of the famous uh, $1 million case with the a minister currently and, and all of that. But if such a law were, were there and improved and were working effectively, perhaps it, it might you know, uh, also help. The other bit that I think we all don't pay attention to, or maybe again is an elephant or an umbrella in the room that we, is the issue of campaign financing, right? So before the party gets into power, there are companies or individuals or people that, of course, would have supported these campaigns. And we're told by a CDD report that what it, it costs, what, about 300 or five, half a million dollars or so, right, to be able to campaign just MP, right? And for presidential, you're talking multiple millions of dollars. So before the person even becomes president or MP, as we see in Ghana, they are hand is in somebody's mouth, right? Um, and therefore, they have to maybe give certain concessions and you name it, and that all ends up, you know, um, uh, driving or hindering government e effectiveness or corruption to the point that now you now have to impose the burden on ordinary citizens in the form of, of haircuts. I mean, this is a big issue, and I think it's one of the things that those of us in civil society, uh, we should try and get some consensus on and push for serious reforms in, in that area. Uh, last but one or last but two is, of course, on the social side and the social spending. All these reforms, IMF programs, etc., have an impact on the welfare and the well-being of the, of the people. Um, in the recent IMF program, 
there's at least a commitment to maintaining um, social spending level at, at current levels. The problem, though, is that if you look at, say, education, um, the UNESCO says that you need to spend about 46% of your GDP every year on education, right? Um, and 6% is about the benchmark. In fact, if you do the analysis, um, since about 2019 thereabouts, um, the amount that we're spending is actually come down. As a share of GDP, it's, it's still within the 4 to 6 percent, but it's the lower end of, of that. And this means that people are staying out of school. It means that desks that are not available. It means that you know, children perhaps not you know, uh, completing uh, certain progress benchmarks that you know, uh, needs to be, needs to be uh, attained. And I think that's something that, again, uh, from a reform and advocacy point of view, we should be paying attention to and driving uh, a lot of things uh, in there. My last part, two or three points, and I would uh, try and wrap up. So I've been talking a lot about the politics and what needs to be done to improve it, right? So I think across the political divide or space, most of the parties maybe call it mean well, but the devil is in the details. Okay, so here I've got the 2016 and 2020 manifestos of the two parties. Now observe how the the titles actually change, right? So in the 2016 manifesto of the NDC it says changing lives, transforming Ghana, right? In the 2020 manifesto of the MPP. Yes, leadership of service, protecting our progress, transforming Ghana for all. And then you look at the same thing, 2020 NDC manifesto, MPP manifesto. So the MPP manifesto for 2016 says, change an agenda for jobs, creating prosperity and equal opportunity for all. Now watch the 2020 uh, uh, NDC manifesto. It says that Jobs, prosperity, and more. The People's Manifesto, right? So you may even ask, okay, so who was copying who <laughs> in, in, in that? But the, the, the important point here really is that there seems to be some um, consensus about what needs to be done. The thing is, there are some impediments that block them when they now come into power that prevents them from doing what needs to be done. And of course, that's also to say that even when you look at the manifestos itself, some of them are not necessarily connected to even broader national level um, development you know, uh, outcomes. So let me quickly show you what I mean by, 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 by that, right? Okay. So we've actually got a medium term policy framework in Ghana. Um, there's no long-term national development plan, but at least the NDPC has a document. It's a big document, over 340 pages, and um, uh, it's publicly available, called the National Medium-Term Development Policy Framework. And this is a very, very interesting document, but it shows you what Ghana should be doing or aspiring to at least over the next three, four years. It's something that's done consistently. And then also there are indicators in this document that shows you baseline. So where are we starting from? Where do we want to go? How do you measure? And all of that. If you take any of the party manifestos and you do a deep analysis and contrast it with either this document or go back to prior documents, you know, Ghana, GSDD, we've had GPRS 1 and 2 and all of that, you see a big disconnect between what they say they want to do as parties and what Ghanaians also say they want as framed in this national development document. And again, it's, I think it's quite um, important because for me, the thing then is that every policy going forward, if we don't want a recurrence of the haircuts and the economic crisis and all of that, going back to the tax and spend, Every policy going forward must be subjected 
to rigorous peer review, and we need to establish the evidence base and make a business case for it. Let me quickly explain on this. In the UK, where uh, I, 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 I shuffle between, any government proposal or document has two key things. There's what they call the logic framework. And the logic framework basically shows how you're going to move from um, inputs to counting outputs and counting outcomes. So let me explain. In Ghana, a politician may come and say, oh, but I've done the, the, the road in the village, right? Or I've built some school here. But the question is, if you went back three, four years, has that necessarily improved either productivity or learning outcomes or education outcomes and all of that, right? So a lot of our politics, you see that the emphasis is on inputs, especially in election year. Oh, all of that. But it's not really driven or connected to a broader development point. If you look at this document that the NDC, NDPC has, there are very clear benchmarks to connect all that you're doing at an activity level to counting um, you know, outcomes and uh, overall um, impact. So we need to improve uh, on that. And also, you need to have had a business case so it's not just a logic framework, but it's a clear business case that is subject to rigorous review. We, we were here, we had things like uh, 1D, 1F, and other of these major government flagship policy initiatives. But where is the evidence base underpinning those right, initiatives? And what sort of learnings have we taken from them to sort of uh, improve them? And I think this is something that is very, very, very important um, if we are trying to address the root cause issues, uh, you know, uh, going uh, forward. Because the, the level of the, this would be able to constrain some of the excessive partisanship that we have seen across many um, of our uh, institutions uh, in, in, the, in the country. So in trying to wrap up uh, the, the conversation here and also some uh, ideas for uh, reforms that I have highlighted, including um, the, the, the opportunities, I mean, I think I, I, sh I should have touched on that. It's not all lost. I mean, we've, we know that Ghana has tremendous uh, opportunities and this government document actually highlights some of the priority sectors that needs um, investment. But these investments cannot happen in a vacuum when we're just wasting and throwing money about. And the very citizens that you also need money from um, to be able to finance some of these programs, you're giving them haircuts uh, as, as well. So in, in trying to, to wrap up, I, I think that Yes, there is uh, some truth in the fact that both the pandemic and Russia-Ukraine war fundamentally have exposed major weaknesses in our economy. So we've been talking about diversification, structural transformation from the 1980s, and I'm sure uh, Anke Rekubobe would have done even a lot of uh, work on that way back then, but it hasn't happened. And, and the part of the reason is that it goes back to this um, political economy cycle of borrowing and spending, especially around um, elections. And I think the analysis also shows that over the medium term, you're going to have a constrained um, fiscal space. So you have to prioritize on the areas that you need to uh, spend your, uh, your monies on. There are also opportunities, of course, for uh, increasing and improving revenue flows, such as with, uh, with property uh, taxes. And in property taxes, you can see in, in, in the case of South Africa, almost 6% of their revenue base is actually coming from these um, property uh, tax, you know, 
uh, handles. And, and that's what we need to do to try and lessen more on um, the uh, direct ad valorem type taxes and more of individual taxes and other tax forms that would also depend um, social uh, uh, account accountability. I mean, in terms of the budget itself and the budget financing, the point here is that we need to start interrogating and pushing our political class and politicians to move from counting inputs like doing a road or a hospital to now thinking about outcomes. How is this improving or reducing poverty? How is this addressing inequality? And, and all of those things, very, very um, important. And then um, public procurement is one of the things that we have to uh, significantly address as well. As for opportunities, Ghana has always had opportunities. The problem is that we start, make progress, and then we go back. And not until, in my view, we address the root causes, we will still be here talking about the same thing. So thank you very much, and I hope I have been within time. If not, please forgive me. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Theo Echampong. I think it's only fitting, even on social media, uh, people were lauding you for your very lucid thoughts and the wonderful presentation. Please, let's, let's do it for our speaker one more time. We're still live on Joy News Television on Joy 99.7 FM. If you've joined us, it is the Bar Redu Memorial Lecture, and our main speaker just shared his thoughts with us, Dr. Theo Echampong, an economist and political risk analyst. Before I segue into our next conversation where we are going to be hearing from our second speaker, who also is with Daylex Finance, just a brief recap of some of what Dr. Echampo mentioned, and also to avert our minds to a document that many people apparently have not seen. Ghana at 100, you ended up by speaking about the NDPC, National Development Planning Commission. We all should look at that document because I'll just cite three things from uh, some pages in that document, 11, 27, and I think 29, about the Ghana we want, about what other countries are doing by way of development plans, and our projections, economically speaking, and where we find ourselves, and whether it is anything uh, to write home about. But Dr. Champon did make mention of one thing. Our leaders, from, from where I said, clearly know what must be done. How to do it, I suppose, is the problem. He spoke about the revenue expenditure gap, and the fact that politics is manifesting in our economy. And so with that, it has hobbled the central bank. And once politics comes in, level heads will not prevail. He made mention of the fact that a second DDEP is not needed. And that our penchant for loans, citing the eurobond market and so on, will keep us marking time. If we don't get a grip on our economy, we may come back here just a few years down the road talking about these same matters, recycling the same matters. It means, as a country, we are not moving forward. And that very troubling matter of campaign financing, that's when maybe Jesus will have to come down and um, help us with it. But just to stick to my promise, I made mention of these three things that I would, I would bring forward before I introduce the next speaker. If you look at the Ghana at 100 document, which has been put out collaboratively over the years through the different administrations with input from different regimes and put out by the NDPC itself. When you go to point one, point two, justification for a long-term development pr framework, uh, we all remember Senior Minister Osafo Mafu and what he said about a 40-year development plan. Examples of countries with long-term frameworks, Algeria, National Vision 2030, Bahamas, Vision 2040, Kenya, Vision 2030, Malaysia, Vision 2020, Wasawan 2020, New, New Zealand, 30-year infrastructural plan, Qatar, Vision 2030, Saudi Arabia, Vision 2030, South Africa, 2030, South Korea, 2030, Uganda, Vision 2040. Where are we? What is ours? 
he pointed to something between 2022 and 2025. What is our long-term framework for Ghana? And then you go to the very next point, which I'll get to very quickly so we can uh, proceed from here. In terms of the Ghana we all want to see. I'll get there shortly. There are a number of pages. I'm almost there now. Good. So it says vision. The vision of Ghana at 100, and by the way, that would be 2057, 1957 to 2057, is to achieve a democratic, inclusive, self-reliant, developed country by 2057. Are we democratic? Depends on what you're looking at. Inclusive? As for self-reliant, developed country by 2057, may God get us there. With our work, of course. But if you consider, this is what I'll leave you with. If you look at the portrait of Ghana at 100, so many things are lined up. One of them that caught my attention, and later Doc and Mr. Dr. Chairman, maybe you can share with me. It says for point two, by 2057, it is envisioned that Ghana will be a high-income country with the following minimum characteristics. And the only one I'm highlighting, point two, with a nominal GDP, nominal, of course, of approximately... $3.4 trillion. Where are we now? Around 70 plus billion. $3.4 trillion. We're in 2023. So that's what? 30 years more. So th some 34 years from now. That's what we're aiming at. A nominal GDP of approximately $3.4 trillion. And per capita GDP of not less than $50,000 equivalent. I'll leave it to you. He's reminded me that we're at 3,000. So we have another what? How much to go? I'll leave it to the speakers later to elaborate on that. So we'll move on now to some commentary. And uh, we're going to have from Dalex Finance, a senior investment manager, Agnes Sewa Abankwa. Please, let's put our hands together as we welcome her. Please, let's keep clapping till she gets here. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Dr. Theo Echampong, that was an insightful presentation. I was taking notes the whole time, so thank you for that. Mr. Chairman, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Roiku Brobe, thank you. Thank you to the Ghana Institute of Public Policy Options and the Multimedia Group for this opportunity to share my thoughts on the haircut, prospects for investment in Ghana in the next decade. My name is Agnes, Agnes Sewa Bankwa, and I've been in the investment space over the past 14 years. I've been instrumental in funds mobilization and maintaining clients' portfolio during this period. So I've been here a little bit. I've seen the good, I've seen the bad in the financial sector. I can be reached on the number on the screen if you need any form of financial advice. I'll be speaking briefly on the haircut effect I'll try and estimate what's going to happen in the next decade and what we can do to accelerate recovery. I'd like to share a story. So at the beginning of this year, a good friend of mine, Cecil, lost his mother. And we had a long discussion about loss and you know, how it's part of life. It was a pretty long one. At the end of a discussion, Cecil says, Agnes, can you lend me 10,000 CDs? January, 10,000 CDs. I didn't have that kind of money then. <laughs> you know, and the only 10,000 I had was something I had set aside for the children's school fees. And so it wasn't something I could easily give out. And he said, oh, don't worry, I'll, I'll pay. It's a bridge loan. Just give me... Right after the funeral, I'll give you your 11,000. Oh, I'll, I'll give it to you. 
Reluctantly, I gave the money to Cecil. We went to the funeral. It was actually in Kumasi. Cecil is my good friend. He's also my senior colleague in the office. So we went to support him in Kumasi. When I got to the funeral grounds, big funeral, tents, canopies, food, there's buffet here, there's cocktail, there's sobolo stand. Hey! I was like, wow. <laughs> So we sat there, I looked from across, and then I saw another canopy with some dignitaries walking and giving donations. You know, when the donations was going on, all I was thinking about was my 11,000. <laughs> so I kept saying, hey, Missy Kano, Missy Kano, Missy Kano Naabano. Saturday passed, Sunday, we went for the Thanksgiving service. After the service, they said, Let's meet at the family house. When I got to the family house, another big tent, food, fufu here, banku, eh. Me, I was thinking it was going to be a very moderate, for someone who's asking me to lend you 10,000, I was expecting a small. So my colleagues and I were, oh, Cecil, I had, we see any mommy here. Oh, this is a nice one. And then we came back to Accra because of work. Cecil resumes work on Thursday, and we are all commending him. Oh, Cecil, we see you, mommy, ye. Oh, why are dear the funeral? All I was thinking about was my money. So when everybody left, I walked up to him. I was like, Charlie, 11 k how far? Are you paying it into my account or mumu? All of a sudden, my friend starts fumbling. Hmm, I give a year no. And sawana mba crow. Sawana mba. Eh? Look at the buses we rented from Accra to Kumasi. Look at the uh, event planner, how much we paid. Look at all of this. And people came giving donations as low as 100 CDs, 200 CDs. Sister, yaboka, yaboka. So you know what? Instead of paying you at the end of the month, let me pay you in December. You know in December we'll get bonuses, so I'll pay. And then I promised you an interest of 10%. I was supposed to give you 11K. Can we make it 500 instead? Ladies and gentlemen, you can imagine my sense of outrage. Ah, what does this guy want to tell me? You know, this is money for my fees. And we all know that usually by, in January, when school reopens, later by the end of the month, the schools want you to pay. And I didn't even inform my husband about this money. What is this guy telling me? How, how do I pay my children's school fees? And this is my good friend and also my senior colleague. So I couldn't really express myself the way I wanted to. Ladies and gentlemen, this is exactly what the government of Ghana has done with the introduction of the Domestic Debt Exchange Program. It has affected the financial sector and it has devastated it. As we all know, there's a link between the government and the finance sector. And so the moment the government fails in paying any of its obligations to the finance sector, it puts the whole system in disarray. And this comes with compounding effects. One of those effects is liquidity. Just like we all need blood to live, liquidity for every organization is key. That is what the organization needs to run smoothly. And so the moment a financial institution is not liquid, then we are headed for trouble. I'll give you a realistic example. In 2018, yes, Dalex Finance issued some bonds, some corporate bonds. And these bonds were meant to mature in 2023. As part of our uh, strategic measures, we decided that we'll set aside a sinking fund by investing in some GOG bonds so that immediately in 2023, we can pay off our bondholders. Then in 2023, haircut. So for the period of January, February, March, we had to suspend lending. We couldn't lend just so to um, maintain our corporate image. We couldn't lend. And for every financial institution, your core mandate is to buy ideal funds from individuals and sell 
that is how you make profit. And so if you do not have the funds available, it means that you are headed for trouble. And if you are not liquid, your valuation is low. Who would want to invest in an organization with low value? Nobody, nobody will be interested. And adversely, if your liquidity is low, you can't make any profits. I'll quickly talk about the other effects that this domestic debt exchange program or the haircut has had on the financial sector. Individuals no longer have confidence in the financial sector. Let me take you back to 2017 when we had the cleanup exercises. exercise. You notice that individuals who had Forex were not affected. Individuals who invested in real estate or in the real sector were not affected. It was only individuals who had their funds in financial institutions that were affected. So their monies were locked up. Then in 2023, we're talking about haircuts. If you have Forex, you're cool. If you invest in the real sector, if you have real estate or you're a real estate owner, you're fine. But individuals who invested in financial assets through financial organizations who bought sovereign debts are the ones who are affected. And so all of a sudden, the person is thinking, why should I invest in a financial institution? Why don't I also buy dollars and stash it under my bed? And we all know the effects when there's pressure on the dollar. The CD depreciates the more. If your valuation is low, like I said earlier, access to foreign markets becomes difficult. If you go to a poultry farm and there are layers, and the owner says that this layer can give you 10 eggs in a day, this one can give you one layer in a day, which one would you go for? You'd go for the one that gives you 10. And so if your valuation is low, how then do you go even to the external market and go and borrow? We talk about the fact that the private sector is the engine of growth. And I spoke about the Dalex example. If you're not lending to the private sector, they want, they want loan and their loan applications are denied, how do they employ more people? How do they employ more people? How do we get the economy running? And so I talked in the beginning, I talked about the compounding effect. It affects everybody. And that is where we are now. I want to be brief. And so I'll go, I'll talk about, in my estimation, what is going to happen in the next decade. In the next 10 years, I've categorized them into three phases. The survival phase, which will take about two years. The consolidation and re recapitalization stage, which will take about four years. And then hopefully, we'll be looking at recovery. In the next two years, there's going to be a lot of write-offs. In 2022, 2023 actually, when you look at most or all of the bank's financial statements, you realize that they recorded huge, huge losses. And it is as a result of the DDEP. So if we want to move forward, we'll need to look at write-offs. Most of these monies will need to be written off in order for the financial sector to gain some form of stability, be back on its feet, augment its capital, and then the economy can run smoothly. Dr. Champon talked about the stabilization fund. It's, a, it's some fund that the government sets aside for stressed institutions. I heard about the stabilization fund in 2022, and yet still nothing has been done. The money should be up and running now to support these struggling institutions. We don't have to do it the Ghanaian way. When we're going for committee meetings, we're doing this. No, the money should be there so that distressed institutions can have access to that money and loan and give out more loans. Because for financial sectors, that is how we thrive. That is how we make money. And 
when I look at the survival stage, um, I, I compare it to a wounded lion. When a lion is wounded and it's able to get back on its feet, it becomes very aggressive. And so in the next four years, we need to be aggressive. Institutions that are struggling probably might experience takeovers. There'll be some consolidation of some banks. And we also need to look at recapitalization. Bank of Ghana gave a minimum capital requirement for every financial institution. Last year, the, the CD to the dollar was six CDs to the dollar. This year, it's almost double. And so what it means is that your minimum capital requirement, whatever, min whatever money you have as your working capital, has been halved. So the value is low. So we need to look at recapitalization. Once we are able to do this, hopefully in the, in the next, the other four years, we'll be looking at recovery. And mind you, this recovery is going to be a painful process. We saw the figures and the numbers that Dr. Champon gave us. It's going to be slow and it's going to be painful. How do we accelerate this recovery? I love this quote by San Chu. And he says that in the midst of chaos, there is also opportunity. It looks very bad. We've spoken about a lot of things. But I think that there is still hope. So what do we have to do? I'll talk about the stability fund once again. The government of Ghana needs to make the stability fund available. And earlier on, I said that access to foreign funds is going to be difficult because foreign people are looking at the fact that you're not making profits. Why should I invest in you? But I think that the financial sector can leverage on a few things. Yes, things are not that good, but Ghana is still a fertile ground for investment. We have other indicators that are working for us. We are peaceful, we have a working judiciary, and we have a stable democracy. And so I believe that these institutions can leverage on that and look to foreign investors for funds because we would need that to stabilize the economy. Finally, I'll talk about the non-bank cleanup, which happened in 2017. I know that the Bank of Ghana says that the cleanup has been done. But I believe that there are some debts in the corners of that room that needs to be worked on. There are people who still have locked up funds from some institutions, and then they haven't received those monies up till date. So if we want to make progress, we should be looking at that. We have to look at our spending. Dr. Champon talked about spending more on, um, um, on the government side, but I'll talk about it from the financial side. This is not the time for financial institutions to be flamboyant. You need to check your processes and align your cost and your revenue. And I'm hoping that if we're able to put all these things in place, we will definitely survive we will recover, and as we always say, this too shall pass. Thank you. Thank you very much for that powerful presentation, insightful what you've shared with us this afternoon. In case you just tuned in, while well, you're catching at least some part of the 2023 Baredu Memorial Lecture. Today, the topic, the theme, which has been delivered on by Dr. Thierry Champong, economist and political uh, risk analyst, beyond the haircut, 
haircuts and or record uh -huh. beyond the haircut the prospects for investment and public finances in ghana in the next decade a short while ago, we also heard Agnes Sewa Bankwa, Senior Investment Manager at Daylex Finance. I'll corroborate what you said, Sewa. You, you said something, and so you are not aware. Sometime, was it late last year or very early this year, a friend reached out to me and said she needed a loan. There was a family thing going on. I don't know whether, I don't think it was a funeral, though. And she needed a certain amount of money. I didn't have that kind of money. I don't have that kind of money. So... Looking at the rates of different banks and everything going on, I decided to reach out to Delex Finance, my own uncle, Joe Jackson. And I said to him, oh, senior, someone else needs a loan. And this is the, can you help? Say, well, what you told us, you are not even able to give out any money because you must have that liquid support from other people's money, so to speak, to be able to lend. They were not able to help my friend. So what you said is a reality that I have witnessed because I didn't have the money and even they, whose top priority is to do that, could not afford to do it. At this juncture, I would also like us to hear from the chairperson, Dr. Edu Anani Entry. He's been calmly following proceedings here. Taking notes, copious notes, I've watched him throughout. And I think he's also about to deliver uh, quite a lot on this matter. Please, let's welcome him. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Moderator. As you said, I, I have a lot, but we don't have the time. If it's my day that I'm speaking, then I can, I can cover all these areas. But I will not attempt to summarize uh, what has been said. I will just use a few minutes to look at the going forward. That, that is how to get investors back to the market. The last the experience you, you had, they didn't have the money. They will not have because people will not bring the money. You see, people, sometimes I wonder when people, they are thinking of financial market is only banking. So they say the banking, oh, they are making returns, they are coming back. The banks are not there for investors to put their funds. They are there for deposits, deposits, just savings and uh, savings and uh, savings account and what? Current account. The institutions that are built to take investors' funds, proper investment, are the, 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 the finance houses, the mutual funds, the unit trusts, they are the ones that are taking the money as investor, investors' funds. The banks, I always tell my students that traditionally banks are supposed to take deposits and lend. That's all. Deposit and lend. But now they have brought all other businesses uh, on themselves. But the very institutions that have been established to take investors' fund investment are the investment houses. And nobody is going there because People now fear to invest. The banks will be doing well a little because for the banks, they will always get the money coming in. Your salary will go there. When people are paying you for services, they will send a check for you. So they will have the resources always coming in. So they are not a, a good gauge of the financial market stability and all that. And that is why any time I get the opportunity to talk to them, I say, you don't think that f banking stability is equal to financial market stability. No. Your bank system can be stable, but yet still, the financial market is unstable because the banks, the regular will come. When we were going to start, uh, I have an article written years back, I think in the 80s, where we were going to attempt to start paying salaries into the bank. I wrote an article that now that we are going to start paying salaries into the bank, the bank should ensure that when people come there, they will service them rightly. Those years, I think it was early 80s, when we started paying salaries through the bank. It became compulsory. So your salary will always pass through the bank. So they will have it. Even if it's for 15 days, at least they have it, and they can also use it as part of If they are measuring their, their, develop, their, their, their growth, they measure their growth by the deposits they, are, they have uh, uh, gotten during a period. Whether it stayed there for a day or one hour, 
It is part of what? The deposit they have mobilized. And you are using this to gauge the whole financial sector stability. No, it is wrong. We must ensure that the whole market is stable. And this market will not be stable when these issues are still there. When we did a cleanup exercise, the first one, people who, who had to get their money from the same finance uh, uh, investment houses, they were first issued, they were giving them 50,000. 50, uh, 50, and the rest, they issued, government issued five-year zero-coupon bonds to them. Five-year zero-coupon bond. My own money is in the financial market. You say you will repay me, and you are going to repay me over five years, and you won't pay interest, and you are not able to stop inflation for me. Then I'm losing a whole value. And the next time you want me to bring my money back to these institutions, no. I'll think twice. Then something happens, whether it is what to please people, we got paid. Everybody sang hallelujah. And you took your money, that money, people realize that, look, this money, if I take it and I go back to another finance house, I will be <laughs> like, uh, sorry to say, a fool that I've gone back. So let me go to what? The government, who is the larger person who we say is less risky, let me put my money there. So we cross that, and people send their money to the government. There are people who didn't even get anything. They got 50000 and they have been told to go to some AM fund at uh, Bank of Ghana, uh, uh, government, uh, GBC. So people don't even have proper records of what they have there. It is, it is sad. It, is only, it was only some text messages that were sent to people to tell them that this is what you have here. That is not how we run even a mutual fund. And if you are running a mutual fund, the law of mutual funds state that you must periodically submit statement of accounts to your investors. Are they doing that? No. People even don't know how much they have there. Because no record. If you send the, uh, what, uh, text message, text message is not a permanent file. It can get deleted at any time. Even if you, 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 you make sure you are keeping it unintentionally, you can press somewhere and it is deleted. How can investors have confidence when even their money that is locked up, they don't even have proper records on that? If you have proper records on that, at least you could even go to some place and say, please, my money is at AM Capital. Give me something. You, you are a patient uh, lender. You can wait until something happens and I bring you. But this, this, you don't even have anything. Is that how we want to run our financial market? No, it is wrong. And people's money has been locked up. They are not getting it. Then again, there are people who are still working. They have not been, their licenses have not been revoked. They are working. And we know they are working, but they cannot pay their depositors either interest or principal when it's due. And we are sitting with guests watching them. And I keep on saying as if Bank of Ghana doesn't care that you put your money there. I don't think the regulators will behave like that. That look, oh, you should have done your uh, what? Your your research and review and whatever. We went to a place where you have told them to conspicuously display their certificate so that when you get there, you know that, yes, I've come to a, a safe place. If not the safest, at least it is safer than going to where they don't have the license. And you think the regulator, you don't have any responsibility towards these people. And for four years, people cannot assess their funds from Companies that are still operating, they said they needed some support, liquidity support. You say your law doesn't allow them. And I say, are the investors, were the investors the people who crafted your law? If you are managing a financial institution and you are bringing out a law, you don't think you should do proper law that will allow you to manage these uh, uh, institutions. We say, just give them support so that they can also give us our money. And we say, if Bank of Ghana think that these institutions, they no longer have any economic benefits. And let me tell you, the person selling on the, the tabletop 
he doesn't go to a commercial house, a commercial bank for loan. It is these people who, who, give, them, who give them the loans. You don't have accounts. No, no bank, no solid bank will give you money where you don't have accounts. They will say, we, we deal with companies. And we, the full of, those of us who have sat on finance committees of banks, before a loan is given, we, we, we go through, where is that, this company? Does he have this account? Does he have this? Does he have that? You don't have. And then you table top person, you come and say, we should give you a loan. You must go. That is why we created these people. So that this one, like the informal, we can call it informal people, can still go there and, and get. They, now, if you think they don't have any economic value, then we are saying, revoke their licenses and assume their liability and pay us. We are not the cause of their problems. If they have not run the place well, we are not their class teachers. The headmaster is the regulator. You should have sanctioned them. You should have put in measures that will not allow them to do what they have done. Deal with them when you have given us our money. Close them down. Pay us and find a way to redeem yourself by also suing the, the operators. If you have to sell their property, sell. If they have to go to jail, let them go. If they, they are found to have committed any crime with investors' funds. But it is not for us to be chasing these people that you advise us to invest with. And some of us have preached investment, invest education, invest education, educating people, invest, invest, invest. And now you invest.